Welcome to Asia Society session, uh, Japan End of an Era uh, and Life After Abe. Uh, we're delighted to uh, welcome our speaker today, uh, Tobias Harris, uh, Vice President of Tenier, uh, and uh, more importantly, the author of uh, perhaps the most timely book I've seen uh, published, uh, The Iconoclast, uh, Shinzo Abe, and a new Japan. Uh, so Tobias, uh, welcome and, and thank you for uh, coming to join our webinar today. Thank you, it's really a pleasure to be here. So um, uh, you couldn't have timed this book uh, better. We're, we're just um, sitting in uh, Tokyo, New York uh, and around the world uh, as, uh, as we, uh, as we um, welcome the new cabinet uh, under uh, Prime Minister Suga. Uh, why did you decide to write about um, Shinzo Abe? Uh, and you must have undertaken this some time ago. Sure. I mean, I, I've probably been thinking about this book in some form, at least since uh, I would say probably 2014 was the earliest draft I could find on my computer, or at least thinking about, uh, you know, something like this. And I mean, some of it was just after watching him come back. You know, this remarkable story. I mean, I had certainly written, off, written him off. I think a lot of people uh, wrote him off. Um, I mean, I remember going to see him speak in the summer of 2012, just, you know, almost because of nostalgia, a few months before he was uh, reelected as the LDP, uh, the LDP's leader in September 2012. And so, I mean, the fact that he was able to come back, uh, particularly after leaving office in, 20, in 2007 in you know, such um, dramatic and, and I think for Abe, traumatic experience, um, experience of that and to come back from that and then not just to come back but then you know here we are almost eight years later you know, talking about him I mean I certainly would not have anticipated that when he came back um, you know that the stars would align and, and that we would still be here um, you know assessing his legacy I mean so and I think the longer his administration got um, the more it seemed to me that I mean a he has a story to tell you know, you know there's just an interesting story to tell about how he came from his background um, rose, fell, and came back. But then also looking at you know, what now, you know, a record-breaking tenure as prime minister and what exactly he achieved in that time, particularly given um, that he had such high ambitions to achieve in office. Uh, so Tobias, um, one of the questions uh, that I got from uh, people when I mentioned your book, which, you know, by the way, uh, for the viewers, uh, is coming out uh, in the US uh, on October 1, uh, but it's already available around the world. And I uh, encourage everyone to read it. It's probably uh, one of the highest uh, reviewed uh, books on Japan and Japanese politics today. Um, but particularly from the Japanese audience, I get the question, what does the title, the iconoclast mean? I, I, I've been getting this question a lot. It, I mean, part of it reflects the fact that I, that I struggle sometimes to come up with a good snappy headline and this one just popped up. But no, what, it, what it does reflect, I think, that you, know, you have Abe, someone who enters politics. On the one hand, yes, he's the, the son of a you know, prominent foreign minister who almost became prime minister, the grandson of a prime minister, the grandson of another diet member you know, that, that obviously you know, comes from a political family, political blue bloods. It's sort of the first fact about Abe that anyone talks about. And of course, that's why I think you know, people look at a title like this and say, well, how, how can we think of Abe like that? But you do have to look at the structure of power in post-war Japan and the fact that you know, his grandfather, Kishinobusuke, you know, wanted Japan to look a certain way after the war and did not his vision was not achieved. You know, you got, you got the Yoshida vision of a lightly armed Japan closely allied to the United States. You know, the constitution was left untouched. The post-war education system was not reformed in ways they wanted. Um, and so, yes, part of the power structure, you know, obviously, you know, an important uh, stream within the LDP, but not, you know, not dominant for, you know, during the Cold War. And I think, you know, so Abe enters politics in 1993, the first election after the Cold War. And I think, it, you know, invents himself um, in many ways. And, and I think it's worth stressing. This is not, you know, sometimes there's, there's this idea that he was sort of, um, you know, this carbon copy clone. I mean, I think it was del deliberate choices on his part upon entering politics. You know, here, were, here was an opportunity, the world was changing, there were new opportunities um, to realize his grandfather's vision of, of a strong, uh, independent Japan. 
and and you know taking aim at post-war Japan. You know, and and he made this very clear when he became prime minister for the first time in 2006. You know, we're going to break away from the post-war regime, and so I mean, this I, I think colored his identity as a politician, and in some ways, it's a story of of how he move moves past this when he returns to power in 2012. That you know, the goal stays the same. I mean, it's still very much how do you have a strong Japan that can survive in you know a turbulent world, a world that's changing rapidly. Um, threatening environment in a lot of ways, a more competitive world in a lot of ways. You know, so the, the end doesn't change, but I think he you know, has a, a more mature relationship with power, um, you know, learns how to, to listen to the voters maybe more than he wanted to, for example, during his first premiership, you know, balancing you know, the need to, to actually stay in power versus you know, to get what he wants at, at every moment. And so um, it, it is, the story of how he acquires this identity as an as an iconoclast, but then also how he goes beyond that in some respect. Mm. Um, one of the things that makes your book very engaging uh, for the reader uh, is that there is the personal history side uh, that you've touched on uh, just now, and it's interesting as you open the book, there is the family tree, uh, and uh, and you trace the story all the way back to Meiji Restoration and the role that uh, Choshu, the current Yamaguchi prefecture, uh, played and the legacy that's carried through his grandfather into him. Uh, and when we think about the changes in Meiji Restoration, the change uh, after the Second World War and the change that is uh, undergoing right now uh, geopolitically, uh, you know, there is a, there's an interesting thread that you're paving. But one question that I had, um, when we think about your title, the iconoclast, uh, and, and the fact that he's remained so long in office, uh, is it because, as you say, he's uh, matured, uh, which is certainly a big part uh, of this, but is it also that the world uh, is again uh, quite turbulent, that we are again uh, in geopolitical times, and Japan uh, as a nation uh, is uh, more coming in line with the vision that he he laid out. How much of this is the environment? How much of this is of it? That is that is a, a perfect question, and I, I spent a good chunk of the day yesterday actually working on an essay trying to answer this question because in my mind this this is the you know was Abe lucky or was he good? And I mean inevitably to last as long as he did um, or has, given that he's one one more day officially, I guess um, that in, inevitably it's a mix. You know the, that I think he enjoyed. Um, some circumstances that I think may, you know, enabled him to consolidate power and then enabled him to stay as long as he did. I think, you know, in the early years, I think he benefited from the fact that the global economy was growing, you know, was chugging along and, you know, that, you know, until, until this year that, you know, that you had avoided a, a big global downturn that, you know, so demand was robust pretty much all over the world. You had those, uh, enormous flows of tourism, you know, from, from mainland Asia in particular, you know, with um, Asia's rising middle classes coming to Japan and, and spending in ways they hadn't done before. Uh, you know, you had, I, I think there was a certain amount of tolerance that I think in a different climate, you might not have had as much tolerance for, um, you know, for, for a new Japanese government coming in and driving the yen down from, you know, around 80 to the dollar to 120 to the dollar, that there just might not have been as much tolerance and slack. But the fact that, you know, the global economy was um, benign for the most part. I, I think it did make his job a little easier early on, and certainly you're, pur you're pursuing reflation um, in a global growth environment that was friendly was a lot easier than it would have been. You know, in, for example, trying to roll out that that policy now, um, it, you know, just different circumstances. So that was something he couldn't control. I think another thing that was beyond his control was that, you know, I think the Japanese electorate was ready for stable government. You know, I, I think there was a demand for change, I think, um, in the 90s and the 2000s, you know, what I call Japan's populist moment. I mean, not the same as in other countries, but I mean, Koizumi uh, governed as a populist. You know, people have said this and, and his techniques at least are, you know, populist style and calling out his enemies and, you know, you know all the high drama of, of, you know, the 2005 general election and, uh, and, and so you saw, you know, high turnout in 2005 and a big LDP victory. Four years later, you know, even higher turnout and a huge DPJ victory and these kind of big swings and short, you know, the, the prime ministers, you know, coming and going and scandals. And, and just, I, I think after all of that, by 2012, I think that the electorate was exhausted with that. And they were looking for, you know, a leader, a leader to stay around, which also meant, and I think as, as his government went on, I think a certain amount of tolerance um, 
even for scandals that maybe in the past would have brought down governments. I mean, that, um, you know, Abe, you know, spent the, the better part of the last three years in, in office, you know, answering lots of questions about scandals that came quite close to himself. And, and despite the fact the public wasn't happy about those scandals, they didn't abandon him. I mean, his numbers stayed pretty robust right up until the end. And so you had these, I mean, I think that was a condition that very much prevailed. And, and I think, as you say, towards the end too, post-2016, as the world looks more um, turbulent and the region looks more turbulent, I do think there was an appreciation for having a leader uh, you know, who had been around for a while, who was an experienced, you know, experienced at, at diplomacy. I mean, sort of being his own diplomat in chief, his own foreign minister for uh, a lot of his tenure, um, you know, had a vision, was was dedicated to pursuing it. I think there was an appreciation for that. And I think it led to a certain amount of forgiveness um, for things that in the past, the public might not have been quite as forgiving about. I will say, I mean, but it is not entirely luck. I mean, I do think, you know, I think he learned um, from 2006, 2007, that if you're, you know, if you're not delivering an economic policy that, you know, addresses public concerns, uh, you know, about growth, uh, about, you know, inequality to a certain extent, you're not, you're not going to go far. And so he had to do that. Uh, he understood that. I mean, you can say that his attention to economics maybe ebbed and flowed over the course of his years, but it was never far from his thoughts. I mean, I do think that, you know, it was taken seriously, uh, you know, unemployment being as low as it did. I mean, I think that was delivering, you know, exactly what the public wanted in a lot of ways. Uh, and, and, you know, and I think it shows, I think you see the polls, you know, of his sort of exit polls showing that, you know, there's a lot of appreciation for what he accomplished in office. Was it everything he wanted? By no means. Um, but, but I do think uh, he learned lessons that he was able to apply and helped him survive in you know, favorable conditions. All right. Well, uh, just a, a note to all the viewers. Um, uh, if you have any questions for Tobias, uh, please uh, send them in chat or uh, send them on Twitter with hashtag Asia Society in Live, and, and we'll pick up your questions uh, after uh, I ask a few more questions. Um, you, you touched on um, uh, the first term of uh, Abe's office, and uh, it's almost difficult for many of us to remember the circumstances, uh, and in, in some ways almost the Greek tragedy uh, mm -hmm. of his departure. Uh, and how it felt uh, at the time. Uh, and you also note in your book how he wrote on his notebook uh, lessons uh, from that time. And I think one of the things that you uh, touched on is obviously the need to focus on uh, everyday livelihoods. Uh, it's the economy stupid part, which he really uh, pushed forward uh, in his uh, second term. Uh, what else do you think he learned uh, personally uh, or institutionally? Uh, you mentioned he matured. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit uh, in terms of that? Sure. Well, actually, I mean, and I think the one thing that he, I think he recognized was that um, he, that he was probably too young and too inexperienced and, and that he should not, maybe, he maybe should not have thrown his hat into his ring in 2006, which I guess takes a certain amount of maturity as well. Uh, although it's an easy thing to admit after what he experienced um, in that year. I mean, but I think there are a few things. Um, I mean, I think personnel was first, you know, that I think he, and particularly when it comes to uh, the prime minister's office, that, you know, he, he couldn't just have uh, people who sort of looked like him, you know, full of, full of things they wanted to achieve, but maybe not the experience, not the relationships, um, you know, not the connections within the ruling parties uh, and within, within the bureaucracy that he, he couldn't, um, you know, as, as it was called at the time, you know, Abe's cabinet of friends. I mean, and it really wasn't even his cabinet of friends. It was his sort of Conte of friends. And, and that, you, you couldn't just do that. You know, obviously you need people you're, you know, who are loyal and who you can trust, but it, it couldn't just be, um, you, know, a, you know, sort of a, a group of young, um, you know, young ideologues, basically. And, and that was, I think, the first lesson that, you know, yes, the prime minister, prime minister's office, uh, had more power than it ever had before, but if you don't have the right people in the right jobs, you can't make the you can't make the machine work. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, another thing he learned was how to let go of, of cabinet ministers, and we saw that you know over the course of eight years, there are plenty of opportunities for um, scandals and um, you know, allegations against members of his cabinet, and I, and I think um, some of the more tragic moments from his first premiership were not being able to just recognize that sometimes you just have to cut your losses. And, you know, in particular, given how Japanese democracy works, where, you know, there's long, long hours of questioning, um, you know, the, the, the way the budget committee is sort of a catch-all ongoing, 
uh, you know, opportunities to, to, to ask anything of the government, basically. Um, you know, that, that you know, having a cabinet minister kind of hanging out there uh, fighting scandal allegations, um, it, I mean, it's just a recipe for disaster. And I think repeatedly, um, you know, I, th I think there were moments where he where he dug in and, and refused um, to surrender sort of a, you know, someone like Oslo, you know, when Oslo has a gaffe or something like that. But I, I, I think, you know, not letting, you know, particularly kind of lesser um, figures in the cabinet go instead of having them stay and, and you know, be a, a lightning rod for criticism. I mean, I think that was a lesson that um, proved uh, important time and again, you know, just to, to keep out of trouble. I think there was much more message discipline. I think that was the other thing that um, you didn't have, you know, because you didn't have a, a really good, you didn't have a traffic cop essentially in the first Abe cabinet, you, you know, a, a clear decision-making process. And I think the, you know, the first thing you see um, when you know, Abe comes back, you know, so you get Suga, who, um, if, if he is anything, he is someone who is a careful student of how power works in Japanese democracy and, and you know, how the bureaucracy works and, and what the bureaucracy wants to do. And so you have him as a chief cabinet secretary was Abe's number one booster. He pushed Abe to run. Um, and, you know, on day one, he says to all the, all the ministries, your personnel decisions are coming to me. Um, I'm going to be the one responsible. And so you already start you know, making sure that the, you know, the ministries are going to respond to the prime minister and, and his decisions and not to the cabinet ministers or not to the bureaucrats themselves. Um, you have um, the creation of you know, probably you know, an innovation that I, I think unless you're someone who spends a lot of time thinking about Japanese bureaucracy and, and how the Japanese government works um, is probably not all that visible, but you know, that basically you ended up with this small group of Abe, Suga, the deputy chief cabinet secretaries, Abe's private secretary, maybe a couple other people who met regularly and were making sure that they were all on the same page on the key issues facing the government. Um, you know, that is not, you know, that was not an institution that existed before. Um, it had not necessarily been uh, formalized to the extent to which they formalized it. And I think that um, was critical in avoiding some of the mistakes that plagued Abe in 2007. I mean, there was not as much you know, going back and forth. And, and in some ways, I think what was surprising about what happened this year as the pandemic came on is that it seemed that this apparatus, which had worked uh, you know, pretty well for, the, for, you know, for seven years, uh, suddenly stopped it seemed to not work anymore, that the decisions that should have been made in a timely fashion were not getting made, that you know, Abe was um, going back and forth and not able to decide uh, quickly, communicate that message clearly. Um, and and the, in some ways, it's, it's an illustration of how well things had worked up until this point, that it's hard to think of moments where you know, the decision-making apparatus did not work um, you know, in, in quite a spectacular fashion as it did this, you know, it broke down, you know, quite the way it did this year. And, and that, I think, again, is something that he learned from, from 2007 and how his administration went wrong then. I, I'd love to um, return to uh, the effects of uh, COVID uh, and, uh, and what it means for uh, the new Prime Minister Suga, mm -hmm. uh, who did much of the control of the Prime Minister's office machinery uh, and the prospect for that uh, as we uh, go forward. Uh, but still uh, staying with um, uh, Prime Minister Abe, uh, I think, you know, he would, uh, he has said himself that uh, uh, one of the missions that he has is to revive and grow a, kind of a new conservatism movement. And, and he really was a leader uh, of that. Um, some critics uh, domestically and internationally uh, have called that uh, nationalism. Uh, you state in your book, uh, or you distinguish in your book uh, between nationalism and statism. And, uh, and you discuss the fact that he, he, he's really, uh, um, his real passion uh, is around the role of the state. Uh, can you uh, elaborate a little bit on that distinction you make uh, as a conservative, nationalism versus statism? Yeah. So it's, which is not to say that he's not a nationalist. I just think it's when we think about his priorities and, and what's most important to him and what he wants to achieve. And, and, and in many ways, what we learned um, from, you know, from his second government. Uh, I mean, I mean, the state of, statism is the idea that I mean, I think he looks at the world um, and, you know, Japan uh, is surrounded, you know, surrounded, it, it lives in a region with, you know, one very strong, large populous country next door. Um, there's lots of, you know, there's the number of economies uh, that are now competing with Japanese industries for market share uh, are, are 
growing. You know, every year, you know, you have new new developing con- countries coming online that are putting pressure on Japan, and you know, ensuring that Japan uh, can survive in a more competitive world. Uh, you know, against a great power like China that is acquiring um, dramatically new military power. Um, you know, ensuring that Japan is still prosperous in this world. I mean, that that fundamentally, that there's nothing more important. And and I think that's what you mentioned earlier, just going, you know, that the story goes back to Meiji. And, and I think um, in many respects, that's where it all begins. And that, um, you know, this is not conservatism as neoliberalism. This is conservatives as, you know, you, what does the state need to do to ensure its survival? And that, and that that's the dominant um, tendency in Japanese conservatism going back to 1868, um, that you have... Um, you know, that, that essentially Bismarckian real politic. I mean, and that's who, you know, the builders of the Meiji state learned from Bismarck himself. And, you know, that you do whatever it takes uh, to ensure national survival. Now, where I think the nationalism comes in um, is that it cre- I think there's this idea of, you know, that, you know, Japan is unique and special. And, you know, he, he cites his grandfather approvingly talking about how, you know, one of the things that makes Japan special is the imperial house and this line unbroken, um, you know, as non, you know, as a, I'm not Japanese, and I'm not, not a Japanese nationalist. So it's not necessarily how I view the world. But I think when you look at where the nationalist beliefs fit in that, I mean, it's, it is this story of, um, you know, that, that there's something special and unique about Japan that is worth defending, that is worth preserving. Um, but you can be a status without necessarily believing those things. And I, and I, and I think um, mm-hmm. what it came down to it, that you look at his second government, uh, that he was might, that he was willing, I think, and, and determined to focus on the building the state part, making sure that Japan um, has the military power it needs, that its state, you know, that has the decision making capacity that it needs, uh, that its economy is growing, that it, I mean, that that it just has all of the sources of power in the 21st century that it will need to ensure its survival going forward. No, it's uh, it's it's fascinating your uh, definition of you know how conservative you are and, and to what period of history do you go back to and uh, and, and this view that uh, he's not a conservative in the kind of post uh, second world war Yoshida doctrine uh, mm. style but more in the Meiji restoration uh, style conservative and uh, and having a strong economy to defend yourself obviously Fukuoka Kyohe being one of the major slogans uh, uh, but underpinning also uh, Abe's uh, thoughts uh, there was a, a question about uh, from uh, the audience about Abe's uh, relationship uh, with uh, uh, President Trump, mm. uh, and uh, and also uh, a subsequent question, uh, follow up question about what that means uh, in terms of the prospect of uh, Prime Minister Suga mm. being able to continue uh, that report. Um, but first, on uh, Prime Minister Abe, um, what was um, the reason he was so successful. I think uh, many, uh, many people around the world are slightly puzzled that he has come out as one maybe uh, world leader who has uh, really uh, managed to keep that report or at least uh, the relationship under control uh, during uh, his term. <laughs> I mean, I, I figured a question in this vein would be coming. So, I mean, I think when you, when you think, I mean, it's actually worth looking at what Abe wanted to do with the United States as a whole and, and look at his relationship with Trump in the context of that, you know, and he, he comes in and, you know, and I think there were times earlier in his career. And, and I think, you know, looking at um, his grandfather's view and, and the stream uh, of conservatism that Abe comes from uh, where, you know, he might've been uh, more determined to, to be uh, more explicitly independent from the United States, you know, allied, but, um, you know, recognizing that Japan's going to be, you know, its own player and it's going to have its own role and, and, and be a great power in its own right. And certainly that was what his grandfather had wanted to achieve, to achieve um, and didn't quite realize that. I, you know, I think what you get in 2012, though, um, when he comes back is, is a recognition that really there is no alternative um, for Japan, you know, for Japan, but to be a, a committed ally, you know, ally of the United States. And um, and, and that essentially you have to do whatever it takes to keep the United States engaged economically, politically, and militarily in Asia. And that, you know, the, you know, the worst outcome for Japan is, is, you know, for the U.S. to decide that it you know, doesn't want to play that role in the region anymore. And so, you know, so first, I mean, I think you see, you know, a commitment 
on the part of Abe, you know, to try to find a way to work with a president that I don't think he had, uh, you know, particularly strong, you know, personal, you know, personal affinities with, you know, and, and I think the Obama administration looked at Abe and um, when he came back and they said, oh no, like, like, you know, here we go, like this nationalist is going to upset all of our plans and, you know, it's going to be a gift to China and he's going to make things impossible with the South Koreans. I mean, and, and, I, and I, you know, people at the time said this and, and, and I think, um, you know, I think many people not in the, you know, not in the White House were thinking that, you know, that, that that's what you were going to get with Abe. But I think there was a commitment um, to really building, um, you know, strengthening the relationship in a number of ways, despite the fact that, that I think there were some differences and that they didn't necessarily um, gel on a person to person basis. So he and, he and Obama, you know, found a way to you know, get their administrations on the same page. And you saw, I think, a tremendously creative period um, you know, during Obama's second term, you know, that you get uh, trade negotiations that um, at least, you know, got a signed agreement that overcame a lot of issues um, that had stymied, you know, the U.S.-Japan trading relationship for a long time. And they found a way to get through those. You know, you upgraded the security guideline for the first time in 2015. Abe, you know, invested a lot of political capital, I mean, on getting Japan into TPP, for example, but then also um, uh, uh, reinterpreting the constitution, getting the defense laws needed to implement that done. And I think even on the historical reconciliation front, where in 2013, you know, it was the biggest source of friction where, you know, you had U.S. officials you know, saying, don't go to Yasukuni, don't go to Yasukuni, and then he goes to Yasukuni. I mean, even after that, I think they found a way to talk about historical memory in a constructive way, um, without as much finger pointing and, and seeking to assign blame. And it, it does clear the way for in 2015, you get you know, the Abe statement, which is probably most notable for just kind of how anodyne it is and, and that it didn't end up being this, this flashpoint uh, in the region. You did get a, an agreement um, in 2015 with, you know, between Japan and South Korea that the U.S. invested a lot of time in, um, in which Abe you know, made an apology, you know, offered an apology on uh, the comfort women issue to an extent that and certainly at the time, I didn't think um, it'd be possible to get from him. Um, of course, that agreement fell apart and, and we don't have to go into the, the, you know, the rabbit hole of why that happened. Um, but, you know, there was, there was a commitment on that front, you know, and then you're know, just between the U.S. and Japan. I mean, you saw um, Obama come to Hiroshima and you know, gives the speech that is remorseful, if not, you know, explicitly apologetic, um, you know, and, and Obama and Abe then going to Pearl Harbor at the, the very end of Obama's administration. So I think there was, uh, they found a way to work around these issues. And it was this creative process. And then, of course, you get uh, a new president, you get Donald Trump, who, you know, if he has any core political beliefs, it's that U.S. allies take advantage of Japan and this is, the, you know, or U.S. allies take advantage of the United States. And he's been saying this for a long time. And Japan was high on his list of, um, you know, those free riding allies who need to, um, to pay up. Um, and, and I think he recognizes that to safeguard, you know, the achievement of the previous years and to ensure that the U.S. remained committed, it was going to require a different approach. And so he shows up at Trump Tower in November 2016, you know, defying protocol to do it and, you know, commits to endless rounds of golf with Trump and, um, and, and you know, does not, you know, unlike a lot of other U.S. allies, does not feel uh, that he can or should take a more critical approach uh, to Trump and, and that he really does have to do whatever it takes. And so in many, many ways, I think it was defensive. I mean, I think there was a recognition uh, and certainly once it became clear that he wasn't going to really change Trump's mind on any issues, but ensuring that uh, maybe Trump's attention was on other countries, um, may, maybe making sure that there's enough room for the U.S. military or uh, the Medicor, just um, sort of the experts to keep the relationship on an even keel. You know, I think the, the U.S.-Japan FTA that we ended up getting does reflect a lot of what had been achieved in TPP negotiations, not perfectly, but, um, you know, I think he fought hard to, to limit the changes that, you know, would go beyond uh, what Japan um, agreed to in TPP. And so in, in many respects, it was, it was defensive. It was not um, this great cre burst of creativity, um, but you also have to think about what's the alternative, and, and it's easy to imagine ways in which it might have been worse. Mm. And um, I'm jumping a little bit uh, to uh, Suga uh, as well. Um, do you expect uh, Prime Minister Suga, who was very much a kind of a domestic custodian, uh, as uh, Abe was doing the domestic, but also a lot of diplomacy uh, around the world, um, it's going to be a, a, a he, he was never foreign minister. Uh, he doesn't necessarily have maybe that kind of personal ease. Uh, 
yeah. uh, that uh, Abe uh, may have. Uh, but he does uh, probably have a similar view in terms of the importance of the US-Japan uh, relations. Uh, do you expect him to be as successful or do you expect to see a change? So, I mean, certainly, the, I mean, we don't, well, we don't really know, I think, from Suga, too. It's not, it's, you know, he has not had, you know, the extensive um, opportunities for personal diplomacy, um, you know, which Abe, you know, remember, um, not that he was conducting personal diplomacy, but, you know, he, you know, traveled the world with his father as his father's secretary when he was foreign minister, you know, that um, kind of saw firsthand, you know, the relationship building and, and, and what um, that can, might create the room for, um, you know, in, in a broader relationship between two countries, you know, obviously, you know, personal diplomacy can't do everything, but um, I think we saw in, in, with a lot of different countries during Abe's tenure that that personal relationship can uh, allows, allows others to do their work. And I think, you know, maybe India is the best example of that where you did have a, a close personal relationship, but you saw, you know, that, that allowed, I think a lot of cooperation on political business, you know, uh, military to military cooperation and all of that, I think flowed um, from the top. Um, so Suga does not bring that. We don't, and we just don't really have a strong sense too of, of how he sees the world. You know, Abe, again, foreign policy is, you know, he's always seen himself as a foreign policy hand and, and a strategist, you know, looking at the world. And, and I think um, another way in which he grew from 2007 to 2012 is that I think he did have um, a more sophisticated way of looking at the world, but the signs were there in, in 2006, 2007. Um, and, and Suga, we don't have that. I mean, we don't have, you know, we just don't have a lot of record of, of his, you know, the writings of Suga, the speeches of Suga, you know, that we just, you know, yes, he's been in the public eye, you know, as, as chief cabinet secretary and you're giving press conferences twice a day, but, you know, he sort of inhabited that role. And so we don't really know um, with any kind of detail, you know, how is he going to handle, you know, the balance, you know, a relationship with China, um, and, and then how, you know, how that fits in with, with preserving the U.S.-Japan relationship. I mean, so there's just there's just a lot of unanswered questions about you know what Suga um, intends to do you know to navigate Japan through the world and and you know he can't wait. There are you know with the U.S. with the U.S. for example, I mean within the coming months, I mean you have some huge questions um, you know that are coming right up. You know starting with host nation support negotiations with the United States. You know where if you're dealing with the Trump administration, all signs point to uh, a significant. Uh, a, a demand for, or an ask for a significant increase from Japan on that front, which you know, I don't, I don't know if the Japanese public is necessarily going to want to just uh, you know, give in to those demands. Um, you have this open question now about missile defense and whether Japan is going to acquire a counterstrike capability, which again, um, you know, I think is going to have to be managed quite delicately, both with the U.S. Uh, you know, with U.S. alliance managers who aren't necessarily enthusiastic about the idea of Japan having um, its independent strike facilities and obviously wants Japan to, to buy missile defense equipment. Um, and, but also, you know, there's a question about what the public wants to pay and what the, you know, uh, fall, you know figuring out uh, where exactly, you know, the, a strike option would fit with the constitution and, and prevailing understandings of the constitution. And so, uh, I mean, he's, he's inheriting some pretty difficult questions uh, specifically within a U.S.-Japan context, not to mention that you, know, you do have a presidential election coming up in the United States, and you might get two very different administrations with very different approaches to Japan, depending on how that election goes. I mean, and, and not knowing um, you know, how Suga really uh, will handle that on, on, a, on a personal to person, person to person level, um, it, I mean, is a big question. And you know, Japanese prime ministers have kind of one thing they have to get right really above all else, and that is making sure that the relationship with the United States um, is working well. And that, you know, the fact that the DPJ did not do that well is part of the reason why Abe came back. So um, it is a question. Um, we're, I mean, we're going we're to just have to see. We don't really know at this point. Mm -hmm. um, there were also uh, several questions from the audience uh, about uh, Abe's legacy uh, in Asia. Uh, the questions point to, on the one hand, uh, Abe being uh, in some ways the savior of uh, TPP uh, and the international trading uh, agreement uh, after the US uh, left. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, ups and downs uh, with uh, neighbors. Uh, maybe uh, you know, one very big uh, exception uh, is India and maybe uh, the Quad. Mm -hmm. uh, as something that he envisioned. So that may be uh, one of his legacy. I do want to come back to the legacy point, but what do you think is uh, Abe's uh, legacy uh, in Asia? 
uh, and maybe particularly uh, in, in Northern Asia, uh, China, uh, Korea, uh, uh, North Korea, uh, and the surrounding uh, neighbors. Well, let's talk about the South Korea question first, because I mean, I think when you look at uh, his legacy, I mean, certainly Suga takes over um, with, South, with relations with South Korea at probably, I mean, I think the consensus view is that, you know, probably as bad as they've been um, mm -hmm. since relations were, were established in 1965. And you know, there's, there's, I think, a lot of blame to go around. I mean, I think there's a temptation to say it's Abe's fault. And if Abe just, you know, were more apologetic and if he saw, you know, just how, um, you know, how, you know, understood, you know, true, if he truly understood just how South Koreans feel about what Japan did you know, during the colonial period, um, that that would be, um, you know, that that would solve, that would essentially solve the problems, that it's just Japan not being apologetic enough. I mean, I, I, I think um, clearly, I, clearly, I think there's more going on than that. Um, you know, I, th I think, of course, South Koreans do want, you know, want Japan to recognize um, the extent of what happened. I, you know, and I think more than that, I think um, particularly this South Korean government wants Japan to see, um, you know, the 1965 treaty was made, was formed at a time when South Korea was considerably uh, poor, was controlled by a military government that, you know, the, you know, that South Korea, you know, that the current South Korean government, you know, basically, um, you know, emerged um, uh, in response to and rejecting, you know, from the protest movements that eventually overthrew, mil you know, South Korea's military leaders. And so, um, you know, that it's this vestige of, you know, South Korea's pre-democratic period. Um, and you know, so they see that treaty um, as, as sort of a, this painful reminder of what South Korea once was, and you know, want recognition that we're we're not that anymore, and that treaty was not fair, and that the, you know the terms should be changed, that you should recognize um, that it was not right that that South Korean government of the day uh, gave up um, claims on behalf of people who suffered uh, at the hands of the colonial administration. I think from it's entirely understandable from Japan's perspective that they say. This is a treaty that we made at the time, and you know, just because you know you've changed in important ways doesn't mean um, that you just get to say, okay, the treaty doesn't count anymore. And I and I do think between your know, questions you know, from South Korean, um, both sort of in the government around the government about the you know, the the viability of the treaty, um, the fact that you know you did have this comfort women agreement that was never ratified by either legislature. Um, so it was sort of a, an informal agreement. But nevertheless, I think from the Japanese side, they see, okay, we made an agreement. We, we were willing to go beyond, you know, Abe was willing to go beyond what he had done before. Um, and, you know, you get a new administration, a, a progressive administration in 2017 that uh, decides it's going to walk away from that. And, and I think from the Abe government side that they looked at that and they said, how can we, you know, how can we trust you? Um, you know, that if we make any agreement with you, how do we know that that's not the end? You know, if we offer an apology, the apology of apologies, how do we know that you're not going to turn around and offer that again? And I think certainly also, um, I, I think even from the public, the Japanese public side, I mean, I think you look at polling, I think they feel the same way. I think there's a sense of, you know, how, you know, not that, not that, you know, we're eager to, um, you know, to have you know, South Korea under Japan's dominance again, but just how do we, how many times do we keep apologizing when, you know, when uh, when can we say that that you know we've closed the book and we've moved on? Whether that's fair or not, I mean, you know, maybe you know, South Koreans um, have a right to say that you know we don't, we don't feel that you've done enough. Uh, but the fact is, there are I think these two irreconcilable views, and where I think Abe is at fault, um, I, I mean, I I think it, it's ultimately a lack of creativity and a, a certain amount of short sightedness. That when you look at the region. You know, South Korea is a wealthy, well-governed democracy. You know, and, and I, you know, I certainly think the COVID-19 has revealed the extent to which you know, South Korea has a, a high-functioning state that is capable of handling crises and learning from past crises. Uh, any vision of, of sort of a group of democracies in Asia that does not have South Korea um, as a member of it and, and really a leading member of it seems incomplete to me. And the idea that Japan is going to be secure in its neighborhood if it can't find a way to work with a neighbor you know, that, is, that is a wealthy, um, advanced democracy um, is a Japan that is ultimately going to be less secure. And so, yes, the South Koreans didn't exactly make it easy you know, for Abe to work with them. And um, I, I mean, and also just on this specific issue with forced labor and, and courts, I mean, it was 
not, not exactly clear what Japan could ask the South Koreans to do. I mean, you had a, a Supreme Court justice uh, in South Korea end up you know, getting indicted um, for, inter- you know, for intervening with, with court cases um, under an impeached president. So not exactly fair to ask a South Korean government to say, okay, you have to tell your courts to stop doing this. But I think a little more flexibility that you saw with other relationships would have been, I, I think, in order, a little more creativity, a little more bending on Abe's part, you know, the pragmatism that he showed in so many other areas, um, I, I think would have gone a long way. And I think, you know, under a new prime minister, maybe there's an opportunity for something new, probably not in the near term, given that you still have these forced labor cases working their way through the court system um, in South Korea. Um, but, but there's a need, I think, for a recognition of the bigger picture uh, in Tokyo, and, and, I, and I haven't seen that yet. Mm. So um, and there are so many other important yeah, areas. Yeah, we didn't even talk about China and all of that, which... <laughs> uh, very interesting question uh, came from the audience. Um, you mentioned in your book about how unlikely uh, his second um, chance was. Uh, he, uh, since the ODP form, nobody had been uh, allowed to come back twice, uh, and he left the first time because of health failure. He's leaving again uh, because of health failure. Uh, the question is, uh, will he be back again? <laughs> um, people have asked again. I, I mean, I would, I mean, I was, if only once, I guess. Um, I, I, I'd be surprised at this point. I mean, um, there are enough people now, and, and I think we're seeing, you know, that the list of people who want to be, you know, who, who can now imagine themselves as prime minister is growing, um, you know, particularly after he you know, was in power now for almost eight years. Um, I, I think the other thing is that there's now a well-worn path, um, you know, for him to follow of, you know, a, you know, and certainly his grandfather did it, um, you know, leaving the premiership and then remaining in politics and, and continuing to be, uh, kind of a power broker and, and, and particularly given, um, given his, his interest in personal diplomacy. I mean, I think as we move into the post COVID world and you know, there's more travel and more face-to-face diplomacy that it's very easy to see Abe playing that role in particular, mm-hmm. you know, whether for Suga or for, for a future prime minister, um, you know, and, and, and I also, I mean, I think one thing that we saw towards the end, and, and this was a factor, I think, um, you know, an increasingly important factor over the course of his, um, of his tenure is that I think the public was just getting tired, of him, you know, that you have the same leader for a while. I mean, I, th- I think there was just, um, you know, just a, a readiness for, for a new face. I mean, not necessarily a new system. And in fact, I, I think you look at the polls over the last few weeks, you know, and, and the fact that Abe's approval ratings have, have climbed after he announced his resignation. I mean, I think that um, there's a desire to see uh, a change at the top, but you know, I think the public still wants a stable government. They still want the sort of predictability they've gotten used to. Um, they're not necessarily looking for a change of ruling party. Uh, I think we can say that safely. And, you know, they just want the sort of consistency and the predictability uh, that you've had for, you know, for almost a decade now. And so they want that to continue. And so I, and I think Suga is benefiting from that and, and will likely benefit from that when we see sort of the first polls of uh, the Suga administration. So I, th- I think, you know, just given that, you know, given that I don't think there's going to be a, a, an enormous clamor in the future for Abe to come back, you know, for, you know, save us Abe. I mean, I, I don't, I don't see that happening. Um, I mean, I've been wrong about Abe's ability to come back before, I guess, so anything's possible, but, um, you know, and at some point, at some point he's just going to, you know, he's going to age out of um, viability. Mm. And, and And you've already touched on something that, other people have asked about uh, in terms of a senior statesman role that he could potentially play uh, for uh, incoming Prime Minister Suga or others uh, and step back more into the traditional LDP uh, mm-hmm. leader role. So um, let's see uh, whether there is a third time where he does actually follow the traditional LDP boss uh, path. Um, uh, Abenomics. So this is a uh, you know uh, something that. Uh, really uh, galvanized uh, his support as he came back the second time and he focused instead of the kind of uh, ideological issues, really focused on reviving the economy. Uh, How successful uh, in uh, overall uh, do you think Abenomics was? It depends on on how you want to define success and what it was really supposed to achieve. I mean, to the extent that you know, the, the goal of Abenomics was not just short-term growth. And you know, the goal was setting out a new 
kind of form for long-term growth, a new model um, new for Japan to grow in the future that would be more driven by domestic invent, investment, domestic consumption, moving capital and, and workers into um, higher value added, higher productivity sectors of the economy, uh, you know, boosting startup activity. You know, I, I think by those metrics, I mean, I don't think it's been successful. I think um, there, there were lots of ideas. There was lots of experimentation, you know, lots of, uh, you know, attempts to try lots, you know, a number of different ideas. And, I, you know, and I, and I think that, spirit, you know, sort of a, a Rooseveltian, um, we're going to try a bunch of different things and some of them are going to work and some of them aren't. Um, I, I mean, I, I do think that is a, a an approach uh, that should continue um, because I think maybe to some extent the Abe government has exposed the extent to which um, this expectation that you're going to have a strong leader who's going to come in and he's going to cut through the Gordian knot of all the, the, the structural challenges and the entrenched institutions. I mean, that, that, that might have been a chimera that you were never going to get that, you know, if Abe can't do it, if a leader as strong as him, as unopposed as him, um, still had to, I think, compromise his ambitions in a number of ways, it, it's not going to happen. So you're going to have to settle for uh, leaders who try lots of different, um, maybe smaller border ideas in the hopes that many of them stick and that it that kind of gradually moves Japan in the right direction, I, I think is the reality. You know, when it comes to just short-term growth, you know, it was a pretty good decade. Um, and, and it's not just, you know, oh, GDP was good or the stock market was up or corp corporate profitability, profitability was up. I mean, you know, and, and, you know, you look on the campaign trail, the, you know, the numbers that Abe always led with were the, were the employment numbers. And, and I don't think you can dismiss that or just say um, it's just window dressing. You know, that when you look at um, in the past, um, when you had um, you know, periods of higher unemployment, you know, you, you, when you when you realize what that means, you know, when it means that Japanese leaving school, you know, don't get secure jobs, you know, and wind up as uh, flexible workers, you know, who, who don't have a reliable employment, don't have access to the benefits, don't have advanced, you know, uh, access to the advancement opportunities. I mean, that has long term impacts on the quality of life for people. And the fact that young Japanese were leaving to the strongest labor market um, pretty much ever consistently. And, um, you know, that in some ways, um, you know, they're still dealing with, with shortages of labor. Now, granted, not all of those uh, jobs were, were you know, steady, um, core, uh, protected workers. And you, know, you still have, you know, a strong contingent of um, non-regular employment that, you know, the Abe government was trying to find a way to close the gap between regular and non-regular workers. But the fact that there was more opportunity for young Japanese, uh, you can't, I, I don't think you can dismiss the value of that and the value that will have going forward. And I think what bears it out is that when you look at polls for, for much of Abe's tenure, he was, the demographic uh, cohorts that he did best with um, were young Japanese, you know, better than, than almost any other demographic. And so, you know, I think they recognized um, what his government had brought, you know, how much credit he deserves with that. I mean, you know, as we talked earlier, this question between, you know, whether he was lucky or good, I mean, he, you know, it did help um, the global economy was as favorable as it was. And therefore, um, you know, Japanese, Japanese corporations could, uh, yield, you know, collect the kind of profits that they were able to collect and, and exports were able to increase the way they're able to increase. So how much of that was his credit versus you know, circumstances beyond his control? I mean, we can, we can discuss that. But the fact is, I mean, he did preside over um, a healthy period of growth um, that really withstood, I mean, even attempts like the consumption tax hikes uh, to, slow, to slow it down, um, that you still had um, you know, healthy growth for, for the bulk of the administration. And, and that can't be dismissed. It just wasn't what Abenomics was supposed to achieve at the outset. Mm -hmm. um, your title, uh, uh, The Iconoclast, has a, a subtitle, Shinzo Abe and the New Japan. Um, you also mentioned right now that uh, many of his supporters are actually uh, the younger mm. Japanese. Um, how much of a new Japan uh, has he created? What's, what's the difference between uh, post-Abe Japan and pre-Abe Japan? I mean, I think the most noticeable differences are, are internationally. And, and you touched earlier um, you know, on this, you know, the role Japan has played in trade, trade negotiations and, and reviving TPP and, and forging ties with, uh, you know, trade agree agreement with the EU. Um, I, you know, I, th I think um, the idea of Japan as a confident um, voice internationally and that, you know, 
ending essentially, I, you know, I, I think this idea that um, I, I think people had maybe before Abe came back that inevitably because of demographics, because of slower growth, um, because Japan is surrounded by these, you know, fast growing, um, younger uh, superpowers in the region or, or sort of demographic superpowers in the region, uh, that your know, Japan's voice inevitably was going to be drowned out, it was not going to matter. Um, and, and, and I think he showed that that wasn't true and that doesn't have to be the case and that it's not inevitable, that Japan actually um, has a lot of money to bring to the table, has a lot of um, ideas, has a lot of um, presence that it can still wield um, if it wants to. And, and to some extent, that was what Abe from the very beginning said he wanted to do, that, you know, I'm going to show, you know, Japanese that if we, you know, are that, yes, there are challenges, yes, there are struggles and, and um, it's not going to be easy, but that if we show up, and if we do the work, that there is a place for Japan, uh, even in uh, this this changing region and, and a changing global system, and, and that the world you know, that other countries want to hear from Japan, that the you know the countries of Southeast Asia want Japan engaged in a, in a serious way and a sustained way, and I mean so I mean going to the the challenges then for Suga, I mean you know that, that I think has raised the standard and raised the bar for what's expected of a Japanese prime minister and a Japanese government that. Uh, you know, Japan is now going to be expected to be present in ways that it wasn't expected before. And, you know, that J Japan does have a, a leadership role to play, even though, um, you know, it's it's less populous and even though it's it's graying, um, it's certainly not alone in that factor. And and so that it does have um, resources to work with, um, even if, even if, if, you know, it has, it has some pretty big domestic challenges. And so I think, I mean, I think that is easily, uh, the biggest change. I think domestically, I mean, I do think there were reforms that maybe were not, did not go as far as were hoped, um, but I think moved the ball forward, uh, so to speak, in certain ways. I mean, I think um, agriculture changed in, in really important ways, um, you know, sort of marginalizing uh, the role the JA could play as, as a political force. Um, I think corporate governance has moved in a direction, um, not perfectly by any means, I think there's a lot of work to do, but um, just more more room for shareholders, um, you know, in the mix. I think the expectation, um, you know, the government is going you know, to continue to lean on corporate Japan to pay its workers more, which you saw sort of consistently applied um, pretty much for the whole of, of Abe's tenure. I mean, some of these look like, you know, maybe, maybe smaller things. Um, and, and on top of that, I think it's all complicated by the fact that um, not really knowing what the world is going to look like when the pandemic passes um, raises a lot of questions about change to come. And, 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 and you know, I don't want to go, you know, go too far in, in saying that you know, Abe has completely transformed Japan. I think, um, you know, sort of my, I mean, one of my end, ending notes in the book is the fact that um, Abe has left a number of very important questions for his successors. And, you know, he came, you know, wanting to achieve this transformation and did achieve some important changes in, in a number of ways. But the biggest changes I think may, may still be, may still yet to come. Um, certainly. And, and also I think maybe factors outside of his control. We don't really know what the future of the U S role in the region is going to be. Um, we don't really know, uh, you know, the, the path that China ends up taking and how Japan responds to that is going to be a huge factor determining, um, you know, what Japan looks like in the region uh, in the future. I mean, all of these uh, kind of really big questions about how Japan, you know, operates and survives uh, in a fast changing region are, are changes that are going to be left for the future and, and how Japan copes with sort of even more aging, uh, even greater stress on its finances. Those are, you know, they're going to be big questions that come with those that, that were not answered, that were kicked into the future um, by Abe's government. And, and you know, so, so it's not, you know, Japan not uh, overwhelmingly transformed, but I do think it is Japan, uh, you know, Abe showed a Japan uh, that can, you know, even with these big structural challenges can continue to play a role in the world, um, is not, uh, does not have to be paralyzed by those challenges. Mm. So, uh, Tevis, we're approaching the last uh, maybe six or seven minutes. Um, you mentioned many things that he achieved. You also mentioned a lot of work to be done. Um, for the audience who may be familiar with some of them but can't maybe ha ha has a hard time putting all of that together, uh, as, some, uh, as someone who's really studied uh, Shinzo Abe, if you have to pick one, uh, positive legacy uh, that uh, Abe has left and one 
uh, I, maybe not a failure, uh, but something that uh, he really wanted to get done that he couldn't do that will be for the next generation. Uh, what do you think those are? Well, so, I mean, as, as, um, as I've already discussed, I mean, I think um, finding a, a new international role for Japan uh, mm. beyond what had really been done before uh, is, I mean, I, I do think it was a real achievement. And, and I think, you know, the response to Abe's exit that you've seen internationally uh, goes, you know, shows that. And, and you know, trade leadership, I think, was a big part of that. I mean, and I think it was the biggest departure from where Japan had been before. Um, you know, that it was no longer going to be a, a defensive actor in trade agreements, that it was going to actively seek to form those agreements and, and to get them done um, and to advance, um, you know, to essentially find a, a way to uh, protect economic integration in the 21st century uh, in the midst of some pretty extraordinary challenges. I mean, perfect, you know, protectionism from the United States, um, a China that simultaneously claims to want to protect those rules, but then is also um, constantly... Um, not playing by those rules. Uh, yeah, and this was not an easy task by any means, not to mention the domestic, you know, that having to overcome domestic opposition to Japan's playing that role and that there were plenty of uh, constituents of the Liberal Democratic Party who wanted Japan to remain um, defensive uh, and protectionist, essentially, in its trade negotiations. Uh, breaking free of that role and recognizing that Japan's future depends on um, access, deep ties, integration, um, particularly with countries in its neighborhood. I, I mean, I, I don't think you can, there's no way around that, that that, that is really, I think, um, the biggest difference and, and really the most important uh, example he leaves to his successors. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think the biggest failure maybe from Abe's own perspective, I mean, it's, you know, when you look at his, the press conference he gave last month announcing um, his resignation where he was, I mean, I think quite forthright in addressing um, what he didn't achieve. I mean, it's, it's probably a toss up between solving uh, the abductee issue with, with North Korea or revising the constitution. I mean, probably the constitution, I think from, from his perspective, just, I mean, just given that this was something, you know, his grandfather had wanted to achieve, you know, it was right there at the beginning of his career as um, something he felt had to happen. You know, the idea that the constitution has to, you know, was not written by Japanese hands and it has to be written by J Japanese hands and, you know, being willing to settle even by 2017, um, you know, for, for some pretty minor changes to the constitution um, instead of, um, you know, sort of the grander changes that the LDP had envisioned in 2012. I mean, not even really being able to get those done. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, if there's an unfinished piece of his legacy, I mean, I think that was, that, that's it. I mean, that, would, that really, um, you know, was just so fundamental to Abe as an iconoclast, you know, the constitution as this central institution that needed to be changed. And, um, you know, that even after eight years, you know, almost eight years that he couldn't do it, um, you know, I, th I think is a disappointment. So uh, this is my uh, last question. Uh, in, in your book, uh, when you talk about the first term of Abe, uh, you show the difficulty of succeeding, uh, uh, you know, him, in his case, uh, a very, very successful prime minister, Koizumi, uh, and following some of uh, his steps, but also trying to differentiate, and in doing so, alienating perhaps uh, both sides. What would be your uh, advice for uh, <laughs> uh, the incoming Prime Minister Suga uh, as he takes over from the longest serving Prime Minister in post-World War history? Well, <laughs> um, I mean, it's important to note that, the, I mean, I think the LDP is not the same party that it was in um, you know, that Abe inherited in 2006. I mean, he inherited a party that was uh, a lot more divided, I think, generationally, ideologically, um, was not necessarily um, capable of, of reading from the same sheet of music, so to speak. And, and Koizumi, you know, had exploited those divisions and, and exacerbated them in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I think what we've seen as the LDP has gathered around Suga um, is that, I mean, you don't necessarily have those really sharp divisions on the main policy questions of the day. Um, so that, um, you know, maybe that I think maybe works in his favor that, um, you know, the ability to kind of forge a, a, a policy direction at the top and, and set that direction, I think matters. I mean, I think keeping the personality clashes from spinning out of control um, is going to be just the biggest challenge, you know, that you, you still have a, a, an LDP full of ambitious people and people who are feeling, you know, now that Abe's out of the way that, you know, maybe, the, maybe their chance will come sooner than they thought, you know, and finding out you know, the right way um, 
you know, that, that I think Abe and Suga together figured out um, during Abe's tenure of keeping, um, you know, would-be ambitious men either sidelined or in jobs where they couldn't cause too much trouble. Um, that's that's going to be a big job and, and made more complicated by the fact that Suga does not belong to a faction. And so he's going to have to find a way to, um, to keep them at bay, to keep them at balance, to keep them um, on his side. And, you know, that's going to ultimately cover, uh, re- require delivering, um, as, as Suga says, you know, delivering government for the people and delivering the results that the Japanese public is expecting. And I think if he can do that, I, you know, I think the public is willing to, to stand behind him. Um, so ultimately, you know, if he can deliver, you know, he, he, he has a chance of, of lasting. But um, as we've discussed, I think at different points during, during our conversation, I mean, he faces some pretty big challenges right off the bat, uh, starting with the pandemic. And, and, you know, he's got his work cut out for him. Hmm. Well, uh, Tobias, thank you so much. Um, for the viewers, um, again, uh, we really strongly recommend that you pick up The Iconoclast, uh, a book uh, that is just coming out, uh, uh, is already out around the world, is coming out on October 1 uh, in the United States. Uh, and in the chat, uh, there's a promotion code uh, for, from the publisher uh, where the viewers who are very lucky on this uh, a webinar uh, can get a 30% discount. So please check that out. Uh, I learned uh, a lot from reading the book, but uh, more so from uh, speaking to Tobias today. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate uh, your input, uh, particularly on this day as uh, the new prime minister starts in Japan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it.